On PM Express tonight, new voters register Imani's perspective. They held a press conference yesterday. We're going to interrogate a few of the things that they put out, uh, including this. See, the think tank, uh, in the last few days, they've, they've hit hard at the Electoral Commission. A few things they're talking about. It wants the EC to reconsider its position on the acquisition of a new uh, electoral system, software, and the uh, compilation for new voters register, which the EC says they're going ahead with. Now, the new system is expensive and, and can reduce the uh, quality of elections uh, due to limited time. In fact, that's a concern that has been put out there. Describes it as a, a recipe for, for bribery and corruption. Now, it suggests the, the EC replaces the, the broken down equipment uh, to augment the already existing ones to, to reduce cost. Now, wants the Electoral Commission, uh, the retro management body, to, to focus on registering fresh voters to reduce cost instead of just the mass registration that the EC uh, is talking about. The scribes as uh, inaccurate issues claims that they, uh, pro they're procuring a new uh, system will cost uh, just 56 million, while making the point that refreshing and maintaining existing ones will cost uh, 74 million. And that's a, that's a, that's a key controversy there over, over what the EC uh, has been saying. Fundamentally though, they've also introduced um, the, a conversation that we've had before, but following some probing about the background of the company that the EC, we understand, intends to award this contract uh, to on sole sourcing and the global footprint of potential corruption that that uh, company has been involved in in South Africa and other countries as well. They're, they're questioning why the EC will go that way, especially when they have issues with the procurement uh, system that the EC had raised. They call that system rigged. We're going to interrogate all that tonight here on PM Express. Stay with us. My guest in the studio tonight is Bright Simmons. Um, you know him. Um, he's a man that um, speaks rarely, but when he does, calls ripples. The last time he did it was in December, and I had the privilege of hosting him um, at that last edition of News File. He's done it again. He's the honorary vice president of Imani Africa, as is the studio. is a celebrated IT brain the world over, and so I guess he knows what he's talking about. But we'll try and see if we could probe a few of the things that uh, he put out today, of course, on the on the back of the controversy surrounding the uh, biometric registration system and the EC's desire to change the entire thing and, and buy new ones for this year. Uh, Bright, thank you very much for joining thank me on, on PM much. Express. <laughs> I, I shook you again. I know, um, I know. Listen, we are all getting used to the new, the new era, the new era <laughs> imposed on us by coronavirus. Social distance. Absolutely. <laughs> and I must repeat, though, this is something we have to stop doing, shaking hands. <laughs> Uh, I, I need to take the opportunity to re-emphasize what the president just said a short while ago um, about the lifestyle changes that we all have to engage in. It's going to be tough because we're so used to handshaking, hugging, etc. Uh, but we'll get there. So please don't shake hands. Um, adapt something else. That is the official presidential uh, directive on this. But it's been practiced the world over. Any opportunity you get is an opportunity to spread the word about how to prevent a coronavirus infection. So on this particular program, uh, Bright uh, just corrected me when I had to shake his hands. It's just the right thing to do. Don't shake hands. When we end the show, I won't shake his hands. We'll try and do the elbow one so you learn what to do. But Bright is here for a very important conversation, one that they say, if not handled properly, could derail our democracy because of the importance of elections. But I want to go straight to the top of this. And in this, in, in, I like the way you did the presentations, bullets. And so there's a lot. It's, it's easy to ter interrogate, easy to understand as well. So let's start from the top. Um, you say the EC is blatantly and consistently lied about the true facts of the current biometric system and its ongoing effort to procure a new one. Mm -hmm. That is at the heart of your presentation. Then you provided evidence to back. What's the evidence? So you're absolutely right. This is at the heart of the controversy. The EC um, said it was going to compile a new register, which sparked controversy. But it, you know, in order to justify why it needed to do the new register, it did not go into the already well-traversed um, um, debate in this country about the Bluetooth of the register and all of those issues. Uh, it went straight for the technology infrastructure. Mm. It said the reason we had to compile a new register is because our system our technology infrastructure 
is currently outdated. Mm -hmm. And we need to implement a new one. And because of fear of data loss, we will prefer to register people afresh. This is actually what sparked the controversy. Yeah. Till that point, there had been really no scrutiny or probing of the concerns of the, that the EC had raised about the technology infrastructure. All the debate had been about the register and whether the register was bloated or not and it was fit for purpose or not. But on looking at the evidence that the EC presented, remember it was the EC that went out and started presenting information, mm -hmm. including a now very famous PowerPoint presentation. Which I have a to copy the CSOs of. Yes, and, and, and the media as well. And eventually circulated to everybody yes. else. And in that document, you would not deny, as a journalist mm -hmm. yourself, that the EC based its foundation primarily on the fact that the equipment that currently constitutes the technology infrastructure for elections in Ghana were procured in 2011 and were at the end of their life cycle. Because it's not that difficult to recognize that equipment bought almost 10 years ago will no longer function as required. Mm -hmm. We probe that claim first and foremost. It's in the course of probing that claim that a whole range of other matters then surfaced. Mm -hmm. So what we discovered, looking at objective evidence in multiple um, reposit record repositories in this country, the Auditor General's reports, for instance, in March 2019, mm. the Auditor General, because it does non-routine audits, decided to audit a number of institutions. The EC was one of those. Mm -hmm. Those records are available for anybody who is interested to look at them. The Ministry of Finance is responsible for evaluating the appropriations requests, the request for money yeah. from the public press made by the EC. The Ministry of Finance has to vet those. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people talk about the fact that the EPC is independent. But that is merely a term of art. The EC is independent in doing what it has to do, but it's not independent in how it chooses to do it. So, for instance, if you have to spend money, it has to go to the Ministry of Finance and justify. Typically, through dialogue, the Ministry of Finance then allocates funds to them. The Constitution does not provide the EC with autonomy when it comes to its finances. Yeah. Then it has to go to parliament and justify them. So the, uh, the Ministry of Finance is a very important location to look for critical evidence as to what the EC has actually spent money on. There's the parliamentary oversight bodies, including the now famous special budgets committees, that also look at the EC's finances and operations and make recommendations to the broader house. Now, when you look at all of these uh, um, trails of evidence, you were able to piece together a very sound picture of the current condition of the EC's technology infrastructure. Which is what? Which is that the EC, contrary to its claims, and this is very important, that it has not really bought any new equipment since 2011, and that the BVR and BVD kits that they have today date to 2011, which accounts for why they are obsolete which accounts for why a lot of the technology uh, items are no longer um, supported by their vendors. All those facts are dependent on this view that 2011 is when they acquired it, and nothing has happened since then. We discovered that it was entirely false. So they've bought additional equipment since 2011? Significant amounts of money have gone into procuring huge number of equipment. Okay. Can we, can we disaggregate the era and say mm -hmm. since 2017, since the last elections? Mm -hmm. 2016. Because since 2016, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because it is this administration that is pushing for this. Mm -hmm. Have they invested in buying new equipment since the last elections? This current crop of uh, administration officials of the EC? Yes. They have? Yeah. Okay. So, for instance, um, and maybe it's useful for your audience if I describe in very brief terms what we mean by the technology infrastructure of the EC. Mm -hmm. So this is a set of technology equipment and software, so hardware and software. It includes something that looks like this laptop, connected to, or they have peripherals or auxiliaries or whatever you want to call them, accessories, connected to that laptop, like scanners, like a camera, like a printer, and together we call it a BVR, mm -hmm. a Biometric Voter Registration Kit. On its set software, that enables the electoral officer to enroll you as a voter. 
They take four fingers here, four fingers here, and two thumbs. The famous four plus four plus two. Then they take a picture and they constitute a profile for the voter and print out a smart card. That typically is the process there. When they've done that, they have a digital media that enables them to take that information and batch it up with districts, typically from district to central. That is part of the equipment. VSAT, satellite systems. Mm. And obviously there's software that also sits at the district level for managing the district operations. Some of that we include candidate and accreditation management and things like that. And that data then goes into the national data center. Then we have a very powerful piece of software called the Automated Biometric Information System, or ABIS, which does a very critical function, deduplication. So say you run over to this constituency, let's say there's a constituency, uh, a polling station here in Fanofa Street, and you go and register. And then you quickly rush off and try and register also um, two kilometers you down flagged. the road. The system will flag you because that data goes into a central system and that's deduplication. Mm. There are two ways that that can be done. That can be done later, like the NIA has been doing, or that can be done online, which means that instantly there is a uh, deduplication effort and you can be flagged immediately. That together constitutes the, the package. Now, notice one thing. If you buy new hardware, typically if there are upgrades to the software, by standard technology practices, they will give you that updated software. So if someone is buying equipment, you expect that they are buying the latest versions of the software on mm -hmm. those equipment. equipment yeah. It makes no sense that you buy a new laptop and then you go and use an out of date software on it. it it's, it's not sensible, right? It's also not sensible if you're buying software that has a different set of hardware requirements or compatibility requirements that you will use hardware that's not compatible with the software. Mm. So we have to look at two things the ECS has done, or three things broadly. Have they bought new biometric voter registration kits? The laptops with the scanner, and whatever it is that I described to you. Yes, they have. In 2018 alone, according to the Ministry of Finance, they bought 2,000 of these. Of? Remember, of these biometric voter registration kits. Mm. Remember that what you're talking about is a complete laptop with uh, connected to a printer, connected to a scanner, connected to a webcam, together costing in excess of $3,000. This is, this is not trivial stuff. Per unit? Per unit. Mm. They've bought something up to $4,000 if you look at some of the numbers that we have seen. Now, these are very expensive equipment. They bought like 2,000 of them in 2018, according to the Ministry of Finance. So the Ministry of Finance does planning in three-year cycles, but they tell you what is being procured already and what they intend to procure. So we've had arguments that go like, well, you are looking at data for planned expenditure that never went through. It's not correct. The Ministry of Finance has the capability to discern between money already spent and money planned to be spent. And we are using data related to money already spent. So that is one piece of the... So your question, your question you, you've asked is, so mm. if you spent that amount to buy 2,000 mm. pieces of, of that equipment, mm. where is it and why do you want to throw Very that away and buy, buy a new one? Very the EC's comeback on that is, mm. yes, they've had to do that, Again, they use that as to make their point. They have to do that mm -hmm. because they had to do a referendum. Mm -hmm. And the system that they've met was not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. But then they also couldn't do what they now want to do for the elections. Mm -hmm. And so the, to, the way to fix that was then to find money and buy something that will allow you to at least do the, the, the referendum. Mm -hmm. But elections, the general elections, mm -hmm. cannot be compared to any of the things they've done in the last mm -hmm. two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So for that, they still cannot do the ad hoc thing of going to buy something just for the purpose and re refurbish. You say, we're tired of doing that. Mm -hmm. The system is not fit for purpose. Instead of just buying 2,000 here and there, let's overhaul the entire system and buy fresh equipment for the election. Because elections are elections and everything all revolved. What's your what's your that, that the system is not some kind of ethereal um, germ or mineral <laughs> object. The system is everything. So it's each laptop connected together, each software on those laptops connected together. So when you bought 2,000 equipment, when previously you had 7,000 to begin with, and then in 2016, you bought, in, from our estimation, more than 3,000 um, um, of these, and then refurbished a whole bunch of other ones. Effectively, you're renewing the whole fleet. Let me give you an example. Take your transportation system in Joy FM. 
take your um, television uh, infrastructure here, your cameras, your mixers, all of that stuff. You realize that you replace certain things at different times because they have different life cycles. Mm. You get that? So there are equipment here that are older than some other types of equipment. So when we say that, oh, we have a problem with the system, right? Mm -hmm. The system is renewable based on the components being renewable. Mm -hmm. So the system is not some kind of magical system. It's the composition of the 7,000 laptops we bought in 2012 or 2011 for 2012, right? And then it's the several thousands that they bought in 2016, which meant that they retired some old laptops, replaced them with new laptops. It is the 7,000 that were refurbished in whole for the 2016 and prepared for 2016. It's the 2,000 that they bought, which meant they retired some old ones. It's that renewal process that determines the system. So it's not very easy to say, oh, we bought 2,000. Remember, 2,000 is what, 40% of the whole system. And we did that just because we wanted to do some few um, not so important things. It's very difficult to justify that. You have to show that somehow there's some fundamental configuration that is a mess. Now, it's easy to look at that because we know for sure that in addition to the hardware that I mentioned, there's one other type of hardware that I did not talk about, which is the one that you use to authenticate the voter either during exhibition when they come to say, is my name in the register or during voting. These are like mobile phones. They're like a POS that you, you mm. know, the banks, you know, when you go to a shop and you want no. to pay for something. They're very similar. You put your finger on there, some information comes up, they scan your card, and then everything is pieced together. Now, those ones, they bought, at the very least, 80% of the ones that they have, they from 2016. You get my point? Mm. Then you've got a software that manages this whole system, often called the voter management system. What you're using, you are enrollment, you are adjudication, all of that stuff. That, those systems, if we place them district by district, every major procurement cycle. So when you say that the system is a problem, my point is that there are different components of the system. And you buy the latest versions for large swaths of that system. On top of that, the question is who do you buy the system from? This, even though everybody talks about STL, STL is primarily an integrator. They buy from somewhere else and sell to you. Mm. The companies that actually were responsible for building the core of our infrastructure are two Dutch companies called HSB and Jenki. One is a software specialist, the other is a hardware specialist. Now, the truth of the matter is that these are companies with impeccable credentials, with solutions that are vetted by the FBI, by the NIST, that's the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US, by um, uh, various ISO auditors. So all of those systems are ISO compliant. And there has never been a whiff of scandal about either HSB or Genki. In fact, the consultant that the, uh, the Electoral Commission themselves claim to be relying on admitted to me in your studios that they have no problem whatsoever with Genki. The only problem they've had with STL. Now, if Genki gives you an ABIS and HSB gives you hardware and you create an integrated platform and you have issues with STL and you suck STL, right? But you, have, you still think you have issues with the platform. Isn't the sensible thing to do to go to HSB and Genki themselves and enter into a proper process for the re uh, refreshment of those parts of the system that may require refreshment at this stage of the electoral cycle. So the point is that it's like replacing everything in this studio because you have specific problems with specific devices. Yeah, because it's like saying I have this camera and I have a little problem with that camera, um, but you know I have that problem with the that camera. So because of that, we're going to take every equipment in Joy FM and throw it away. Because the EC says, because of all these little little problems that you have mm -hmm. with the system. Mm -hmm. They don't want to risk it mm -hmm. with the elections. Okay. So let's start afresh. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, we want to be certain mm -hmm. that what we're going to use for the elections is, mm -hmm. is new. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's the latest technology on the mm -hmm. market, latest equipment on the market. Mm -hmm. So we guarantee that they, they won't be, and remember in 2016 we had issues with software mm -hmm. glitches, mm -hmm. right? They don't want that repeated. Mm -hmm. Because they say they take the responsibility and not Imani Africa mm -hmm. or anybody else. Everybody will blame them. So they believe this is the way to go. Okay. So there are two points there, right? The first point is whether that becomes policy. So every time we want to go into a new election, we must spend over $150 million and buy complete new equipment and start, start everything all over again. That is a, a policy you might want to put forward. 
There's no country in that I'm aware of that have such a policy. It will look ridiculous. Mm. If every time we wanted to do an election, we have to go and buy complete new equipment and register everybody all over again, that would be look ridiculous. So, but that's debatable. You know, so a few reasonable people might disagree and say, yeah, we, can, we should keep spending this huge amount of money because we just want the, the, the best in the world. Okay. Mm. The bigger issue is when the system was new, did we have challenges? Yes. When it was 2012 and it was brand new and it was the first implementation, we wait for it, we had the worst challenges to date. Because? Because of learning curve. Every new system requires you to become acquainted with it. Human factor is extremely important, or the human factor is extremely important. So training people to use the software properly, training people to maintain the software properly, training people to care for the hardware properly, all of those things take time. But even more interesting is the configuration of the system to function effectively. Let me give you a very fascinating example, which has been broached on a number of times already in the public domain, but a lot of people don't still understand it. The EC mentioned that, oh, we did um, an election, a limited, uh, sorry, a district election, and then we had about 0.64% of people um, had difficulty, you know, being recognized by mm. the government. So you had to do the manual verification. Good. Now, that process, it's a configuration process. So let me, the easiest way to describe it to you is say, take your fingerprint and say, how do I do, use your fingerprint to confirm that it's you? I convert your fingerprint to an image. Mm. Then I convert the image into a kind of statistical pattern. So think of it as dots. Think of that 100 dots represent your fingerprint. Mm. Then I convert those uh, uh, dots into numbers, which is what I store. But I have an algorithm that knows how to convert the numbers back into the 100 dots. Now, let's say when you are there and you're about to be authenticated, you're about to be confirmed as you, the system counts the number of dots. And if it's 100, it says you, you are who you are. But say you have a bit of palm oil, a little bit of grease on your hand, and so it counts 99, it says you are not who you are. That would be a false negative because you are who you are, but the technology has more functioned. Let's say the system designer said, well, we don't want that. So if it counts 60, it should say you are who you are. But it turns out that you have a twin brother, somebody close to you, and they have about 67 of your, pop, your dots. If they come in and they do a check and the system says yes, because the threshold is 60, that's a false positive. Funny enough, those two are dependent on each other, if you understand it carefully. Mm -hmm. It depends on the threshold you set. If you set a threshold for false negatives, sorry, false positives so high, if you say, unless it's 99 dots, don't accept the person, you will reject so many people who, for minor reasons, all 100 doors are not reading. So it's a policy matter. You have to determine what threshold you will set. That also means, therefore, you will never have 100% assurance, right? Mm -hmm. Because you always have to lower the threshold below 100. If you lower it to below 100, there will always be people who might be able to pass through. And also, there will always be people whose um, dots are never up to even the threshold. So there's never 100% possibility. The interesting thing is that over the years, Issues around man manual verifications have actually declined. But even more interestingly, issues around the equipment, the, one, the things we're really talking about, mm. their failure and the record of their failure in observer reports like CODIO, like EU observer machines, including the media, we have reports for every election, you know that. Mm -hmm. And in 2012, the number of polling stations where we had breakdown of equipment were about 33% of the total subsequently went down to about 7.5% in the 2016 election. And to the last one that they mentioned, the 2019 one we were discussing, less than 5% of breakdowns. So what that means, therefore, is that in time, the equipment is getting better. So what would be your justification for saying that if I bought a completely brand new equipment, I will eliminate all the problems related to equipment? Well, the data that we have, the objective data that we have, suggests that problems with equipment are actually becoming rarer and rarer or lesser and lesser. Let's look at the cost question. The mm -hmm. EC says that there is going to be a significant saving if they go with buying everything new. You mm -hmm. say, out to the cost of a fresh mass registration, the total loss to Ghana of the EC's actions amount to $150 million mm -hmm. if one factors in contingency. How did you arrive at this? So you're absolutely right. When the EC started this public campaign, its advocacy effort, to try and convince um, the public 
because they went public, right? They came to the media, they went to the civil society groups. I've seen them go into the Presbyterian synods. I've seen them go to the Catholic bishops. So clearly, they, they, they're embarking on a public, yeah. um, com, uh, what do we call it, a public persuasion effort. Yeah. One of the things they said is that, look, actually, it makes so much financial sense to throw away the existing system and buy a completely new one because we asked someone what it would cost to replace this system, mm -hmm. and they told us 74 million. Yeah. However, if we went and bought a brand new system, it would cost us just 56 million. And so it makes so much more sense to just buy a new one. Yeah. And then they also said, we know from previous experience that when you try and register top-up registrations, or try and do top-up registration, what we call limited registration, where you just register those who have 10, 18, or those who are not on the register, it costs way more than we plan to register everybody in Ghana mm -hmm. uh, of voting age. So let's take them one after the other, specifically the technology one in particular. If you take the $74 million figure, you have to ask yourself, what goes into that? Why is it, are they saying it's going to cost $74 million to refresh the system? They are making the assumption, they are, they are making the uh, determination based on the assumption that every single equipment has to go. Every single equipment has to be refreshed anew. Yes. It doesn't make sense because, as we've explained, they've continued to do refreshments every cycle, and therefore a lot of the equipment they have are very new. The reason why they are very new is not only because they were bought in 2018. When you're doing your life cycle analysis, when you're doing your uh, um, technology opt uh, portfolio optimization analysis, one of the things you look at is wear and tear, right? You say, how often has it been used? What is it used for, et cetera, et cetera. These are equipment that often they're used for maybe f uh, 40 days in a year. We have DVDs that have never been used because we always buy more. We have, we have a Lexus margin. We buy about 72,000 of this stuff. We have only um, 30,000 polling stations until now. They want to increase 36,000. And in those polling stations, if they need two of them. So it tells you that there's excess margin, right? There are DVDs that, because of the time we were bought, and because of that excess margin, have never been used before. Now, on top of that fact, right, we've mentioned the fact that we have all these refurbishments that have been done and continue to be done. So you don't have to replace everything, and you don't have to refurbish everything. So you can't get it to 74 million in the first place. Secondly, who did you go and talk to? They said they talked to STL. But STL was sacked in December 2018. And then since then, you've been managing this yourself. Why did you not go to the original manufacturers of the equipment and try and get a proper validated quotation? We know that there are political parties in this country that have contacted them. And they've said that nobody has you know, been, to, um, um, been to ask them what it would cost to try and fix anything that they claim is wrong with the system. So first of all, that seventy-four million dollars makes no sense, right? Because you don't have to do everything all over again, given what we've described. And then two, you don't go, you're not going to the right people to ask. The second point is that if you then use the analysis we've made, which is the life cycle analysis, how often is the equipment used, where we've graded all the equipment based on the procurement pattern and established that only about 25% of equipment require additional refurbishment, and a few others, maybe 10% or less, require you to completely retire the equipment and buy new ones. If you use that analysis, you come to around $15 million as what you need on, uh, from a technology point of view. As far as limited registration is concerned, the EC just lied blatantly about how much it costs to actually do limited registration. So we're going to look at the numbers. And it costs less than $20 million. In fact, Num numbers from costs about $10 million from their, same, their, their own budget, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, uh, budget planning documents that they've submitted to parliament and mm -hmm. other organizations. And so, when you add what it will actually cost to do a limited registration, it's not too difficult to know that doing registering 2 million people will be much cheaper than registering 17 million people. Mm. At the very least, you hire fewer people. Yeah. At the very least, it takes shorter, uh, shorter time. So, if you combine those, you get the true cost of using the existing system at about $35 million mm. compared to the $72 million that they discovered in their tender process not the $56 million, sorry, $56 million that they pulled out from the air, but the $72 million that they actually got when they actually did a tender, which might then prompt you to ask, where did they get the first number from? And the fact that they claim they are currently doing negotiation to bring that price down, but that notwithstanding, if you add inco terms, if you add a whole bunch of other stuff that is not accounted for in the raw tender, you are not going to get anything less than $65 million. So it's not the $56 million that they said. Remember, all that is still just for the hard way. They're not talking about the software because they are still locked in a tender process which is not completed. Apparently, there has been a tender evaluation panel that submitted some report that the entity tender committee is yet to review. So, we're going to have additional software costs. We estimate not less than $8 million there. In total, 
you're not going to get anything less than $65 million to $80 million range, depending on the negotiations that they conduct. So that is significantly more than what they said it will cost to procure a new system. That tells you something fundamentally important, which is that this EC, last candle, has very little interest in being truthful and factual to the public, and the media shouldn't allow them to get away with it. But here's the thing. EC has gone to Parliament, the mm -hmm. People's Representative, mm -hmm. made these arguments, met the committees, mm -hmm. and got approval mm -hmm. for the budget they require mm -hmm. to make the replacement. Mm -hmm. They certainly must have been scrutiny in Parliament. It's more murkier um, than looks. You see, because the EC buys equipment continuously, it's had this schedule where it's continuously asking for money to buy equipment. So you will see in 2017, before the, the, the special budget committee, the EC making claims that some equipment are obsolete, we need to replace them. Every time you look at the Ministry of Finance planning sheets, medium-term expenditure framework and things like that, you will constantly see EC saying replacement of IT, uh, solid IT. But that's a good thing, isn't it? Well, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing, in the sense that the EC has never had a proper equipment audit for, for a decade at least. In fact, during the last round of major audits of the EC, the auditors found out that the EC has no proper asset register, so to speak. They, to they don't have an asset register that can qualify at, from a best practice conformance point of view as an asset register. So we really don't have the, the, the tendency, the culture, and the habits in this country of looking closely at what they buy. That is why I can't recall the last time the EC did an auction, as they are required to do in the public service, to retire their equipment and buy new equipment. Here's a non-technical question on mm. that. Some say, why should we care? Mm. Once the elections are run, mm. it's free and fair. Mm. People accept the outcome. Mm. Yeah, that's fair okay. enough. That, before I get to that... That is a validation good. of whatever... Is, is, a, is an end justifying the means. Yeah, good. But let me end the parliamentary oversight point because it's very important. Mm. It's also shocking that you have parliamentarians sitting on the, M, uh, the EC's entity tender committee now. Mm. My argument is that if it's the same body that is supposed to exercise oversight, if they are complicit in their executive decisions, you can't expect proper oversight. So I will argue that Parliament is partially captured. It's not really acting but there are, as a proper oversight. There were oversight two reps, from what I recall. Well, uh, there are still well, reps. Two, two reps from mm. Parliament, mm -hmm. both representing NDC and MPP's interests. Yeah, so that, that's, so that, that's exactly the point. So basically, Parliament is a major stakeholder in EC's procurement decisions. And if Parliament is already a stakeholder in EC procurement decision, you don't expect Parliament to exercise sound oversight. But, but the, the reason why these people were put there mm -hmm. was so that they understand the process leading to the, to the acquisition. So you make them observers, like the, the done in Zimbabwe, where it's not just politicians who are observers of the process. They have civil society people who become observers. They open it up to the public. They invite the media. So for instance, in the, Zimbabwe was, was just finished its procurement, and they got their equipment about one third our price if you do a proper benchmarking analysis. Mm. And in the Zimbabwe situation, all the field demonstrations, where they go to a polling station for the vendors to come and demonstrate, were open to the public, including the media, civil society people were invited, and they come and look. Mm. The uh, audits of the equipment that were uh, uh, replacing and re uh, the new procurements were all open. This EC is an EC that refuses to answer direct questions. We've said to them, how many equipment have you bought? Well, they met you. No, never met us. They met civil society. You weren't you there? Oh, no, you mean you, they met the civil society so, as a group? Yeah, I mean, and, they, and well, made the what they did is that they, they lectured civil society. Because they, in that meeting... You asked questions, from what I understand. No. In that meeting, civil society had questions that were directed at these specific points that I've raised. They didn't give answers no, to that? No, they didn't have, give answers. And they've not given answers. Because don't forget, we've published these matters in the public medium. No. We've made very significant um, claims about the existing system. We made claims about how new the system is, how functional the system is, etc. Et and they've never been able to respond point by point and say, yeah, 2018, we bought this equipment, but this is the reason why we want to run through 22,000 so, uh, laptops, the EC printers, and, and scanners. The issued a statement mm. the morning um, after the civil society press conference. Yeah. Remember that? Or the, the, the 18 or so civil society press conference. And they said that they had met you in the morning mm -hmm. to consult. But yeah. the civil society guys, including Mani, came to that particular meeting already made up, with the mind made up. No, I think that was a claim they made on TV. I'm not sure they issued a statement saying that. Yeah, but yeah, I because I, I'm, I'm saying it because we went into the consultations with them mm -hmm. after civil society had met. Mm -hmm. But subsequently, they, they, uh, they accused the CSOs, including Mani, mm -hmm. of bad faith. Mm -hmm. And that you had made up your minds 
and nothing they will say will change it. And that is why they will not even bother to engage. I think that is, is that a, is that an accusation you, know, you said? I think it's a fundamental misapprehension of the research-based uh, activism model. So Imani's job is not just to sit there and let the EC come and tell us mm. uh, its, its view um, of, of reality, right? Imani's job is to try and become as much as he can a watchdog, and that means therefore that from the, you know the pitch of civil society, that's fundamental research. It's not that different from any kind of scrutiny, mm -hmm. including the one that you give. You're an investigative journalist. Yeah. So we have done research that have established that your claim that the, the, the system dates to 2011 and it was therefore obsolete yeah. is fundamentally false. This is not a matter for de uh, you know, debates or whatever. We're making a direct claim that the system doesn't date from 2011. And you, when you look at those PowerPoints that you mentioned, do you remember that that was the first clip on the on the on the? That's obsolete. There? I mean, that's that's been your fundamental and claim. We have, we have to change. Good. So we have evidence that suggests that that's not true. It's up to you to engage that evidence and explain why, despite the fact that you have bought huge amounts of equipment. Let me give you an example. On 30th December, 2012, the EC spent in excess of 10 million dollars just settling vendor bills on equipment, $10 million, excess mm -hmm. of that. In that same year, different payments to biometric equipment vendors amount to over $50 million. You get my point? Mm. You cannot spend such large amounts of money. This, I'm not talking about monies allocated in the budget, monies disbursed in the budget, monies that may or may not be utilized. I'm talking about audited accounts with payment voucher numbers that establishes that you pay this money, and in some cases, refused to remit the taxes that were due, the withholding taxes, to the government. So the editors have multiple problems with these payments. You get my point? So this is not a payment that you can say, oh, there's my location, but it wasn't spent mm. on You can be spending such large amounts of money in an electoral cycle, and then come back a few years later, and then just say that, no, we don't like the equipment, we're just going to throw all of them away. Mm. and turn them to you waste. Uh, let's uh, go into the question about the tender process. Good. Uh, I'll come to the, your concerns about the process itself. You say it's rigged. Mm. But let's look at the reputation of the company. You, mm. you say uh, EC tends to award this on, on a, on a sole source basis. Tell us. No, it's not a sole source basis. It was a, a tender. Okay. Mm. But you, I, mean, I, I read that that the EC, there's, there's, a, there's a setting, you know, DC has a certain appetite to eventually give this out to Talis, mm -hmm. right? And you believe that Talis has reputational issues. No, so the argument is being miscon misconstrued. Our argument is that in coming to the conclusion that Talis was the best, mm -hmm. the EC had to disqualify other bidders. Yeah. And one of its primary, if I the most colorful yeah. argument it made in disqualifying the company that had the lowest bid, the company that said, you know, they would do this for the lowest price. Yeah. But at the same time, also had the most experience implementing ele election biometric related technologies. That company had done three times the number of projects that Talis had, had done. And was bidding lower than Talis by a significant amount. Mm. You still have to disqualify them in order for Talis to emerge as the winner. Mm. I mean, technical disqualification, not in the sense that they couldn't go ahead and make the tender, but I mean that the marks that they had had to be lower for Palace to, to prevail. So I probably shouldn't use the disqualification way. They had to prove, uh, um, um, lower their technical uh, qualification in order for Palace to emerge superior. Mm -hmm. The claim was that this company had reputational risks. And the basis for the claim is that because in the Philippines, this company was a consultant to the Filipino. Uh, electoral Commission mm. and the president of the country, the Attorney General, had had concerns about some actions and had threatened um, um, prosecution, investigations, etc. etc. They were not properly investigated, you know. But the issue said we can't do business with them because they are business risk. I'm saying if you make that clear, if you make this a very powerful criterion, mm. you cannot go then go ahead and award the contract to Talis, which has way, way more frightening reputational issues. It's about proving the principle, exactly. Because if the principle is that. You can't give it to one because they have reputational issues. Good. Then why do you give it to the other, who also has a footprint across the globe of the same? Where is that? That not make a single mention of all the reputational issues that Talis have had. Okay, so from blacklisting by the World Bank for corruption, and the active investigation, where the conclusion is that they were part of a scheme to bribe senior government officials in South Africa, from a scheme in uh, Gabon 
where NGOs discovered huge corruption issues from a scheme, or sorry, to a scheme in Benin, where there was somebody that was sitting on the Electoral Commission and whose shell company was receiving money from Jamalto, the unit of Talis, directly responsible for these technologies. We're going to take a break. When we return, we'll, we'll interrogate that, that particular bit about the, the Talis, but also the procurement process and the Imani secession, that that process itself had been raped. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us here on PM Express. Um, let's, um, uh, Bryce Simmons, the issue about Thales, the, the, the truth is they have reputation issues around, around the world. But I also found that this is a company that the European Commission has, has endorsed. They recently bought um, the, the company you mentioned, Jamalto, uh, the digital security company, right? The, there, was, there was an investigation into their background. They were cleared to go ahead and make the no, purchase. No, they were cleared on the trust grounds. True, on the trust. Very, very they didn't go into the... The reputational issues. issues. Antitrust it, essentially is whether you're going to be a monopoly. True. If, in fact, the, the antitrust division of the United States Department of Justice did that work. And I, in I that guess, regard, they're only concerned about commercial monopolies. Monopolies, yes. Yeah. So the truth is, they didn't go into the reputational issues. Mm. But everybody knew it's so, so obvious. Mm. So for the European Commission, mm. for the Justice Department to, to even allow, you know, we've seen what's happening to Airbus, mm. right? Even allow them with that reputation. They must have something that definitely Ghana can tap into. No, I mean, there are a lot of um, corrupt companies that are very wealthy. And if you are wealthy, you have capacity. But competent. Um, competent is a complicated word. But certainly wealthy means that you have capacity. At, at least the European Commission thinks they're competent. No, no. Like, you, know, you wouldn't find the European Commission saying that about a private company. No, they, they, they won't. Yeah. They, so what they would, you definitely cannot deny is that it's a company that makes frigates and stuff like that. So you have a lot of capacity. You have a lot of money. Yeah. Our argument is not that Talis somehow does not have capacity to deliver. Our argument is that we are concerned that right from the very start, the EC had predetermined outcomes that he wanted to meet. And that, pre -suggest, that suggests and presupposes that the EC is embarking on this procurement thing with an agenda, very separate from, I just simply want to improve the system that I inherited mm. in, in the case of the management of the EC at time. Now, if you say that reputational risk is too much is too much to allow into a major contract of this nature because of the sensitivity of the kind of contract that you have. You need to stick to it. The principle must be applied. If, if you then say, look, I'm going to do that and use it to disqualify people, but I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to close my eyes as far as another company is concerned and do mm. it persistently, you have a problem. Particularly also given the, the history of that tender. Remember, the published in April 16th, supposed to close in April 30th. They got some um, entries, uh, some bits. Then they decided that they didn't like the outcome. Mm. They claimed they didn't like the outcome because some uh, tenderers complained. After the fact, they complained that you know the standards were too rigorous, and so the standards should be lowered. I don't understand even the logic of that. This is a company that is this is an organization that is making um, a, 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 a making a, a major claim for a complete new system based on problems with the existing one. Why would you relax tender requirements? So that logic doesn't really apply. Mm. Then, they, because of course they didn't get what they want, they republished the tender in uh, August. They got some new bits. Some very powerful companies up, um, um, applied, powerful as in wealthy and have a lot of capacity. And then they took four months, during which there were a whole manner of things that I'm not going to go into. But somehow, they managed, the tender evaluation panel, which is typically a technical uh, team, managed to come up with the results. And typically, this is escalated upwards to an NT tender committee, which is usually the big people in the organization. Mm. Now, they didn't say, but even while the process was ongoing, they kept sending correspondence to the technical evaluation panel, trying to disqualify some of the companies. So there's a very big company called Idemia, which is very, very, very um, well noted in this space. Um, actually, well noted in this space than Jamalto, mm. that's the Thales unit called Idemia. And initially, they wanted them out. Eventually, through a manner, you know, back and forth, they allowed them through. Then they got a result. They then said they didn't like the result. So they found some other way to get a result that they wanted and then went to the Public Procurement Authority for approval. But somehow, the person who chaired that, organ um, that process felt that this was no longer something that they could vouch for. They dissociated, ourselves, dissociated themselves from the process. The EC then went back and said, look, we are dissolving this, the committee, the tender evaluation panel. We have a new tender evaluation panel. 
if you do that, that's a new tender. To be fairly honest, because these are new people, you have to look at all the evidence again, etc. Then they went through a kangaroo, <laughs> a kangaroo effort. But there will be a lot of work that would, would have been done by the, the predecessor. Court. Not if that work was completely substandard and had to be thrown out to the point where you go ahead and not change members of the committee, but dissolve the whole committee. 10th January, they decide to start the process all over again. 13th January, they have their first meeting. 17th January, they, set, they are set with their terms of reference. 18th January, there's demos and you know, new technical presentation. 19th January, they write a report saying Thales had won, in which there are arithmetic mistakes. You know, you had a 100 point scale. I've, I've seen, I've seen that. They said it's just typos. You don't do that for a $72 million award. A proof editor costs how much? How much does a proof editor cost to make that kind of, a, a, a materially substantive uh, error? Then they, you know, so basically what I'm saying is that it's shoddy. I'm not saying that that mm. makes that illegitimate. So they do very shoddy work. And in the hurry, they have arithmetic mistakes. Then they decided that they've now awarded the contract to, sorry, they've now um, approved Thales to go into negotiation phase and have an award. If through that mechanism, we then discover that you used a criterion to rule out a particular company and you refuse to even look into the possibility that Thales must, might suffer from that particular criterion, then we have basis to just find that you had a predetermined conclusion, which is the whole point about tender rigging. Mm. So at this point, mm -hmm. you've had your say, mm -hmm. EC says we're going to have our way. Mm -hmm. um, so where do we go from here? So two things there. Where are we now? So where we are now is that the EC is yet to formally conclude this hardware tender because apparently there are still negotiations going on and they have to have a real award and all of those kind of things. Mm. Once it's done that, they have to go into contracting with a company. Yeah. That takes some legal work because the negotiation is on financials. There's legal negotiations also going in parallel. Once that has been done, there is a PPA approval at that point and then you can go into specification of what exactly must be bought based on the new renegotiated position. Then they have to go and produce the equipment. Then they have to ship it to you. Then you have to test it. The biometric registration is in April. There is another problem. Because the tech mm. software was unbundled, they didn't want to use a consortium that they did last time where all the solutions were provided by one yeah. counterparty. Now they say, no, we want the software separately. And we want the source code to the software. And we want it platform agnostic. We want so and so and so and so and so and so. OK. So they, do a, they, they launch another tender in October 2019. As usual, they don't like the results, they cancel it. Some of the companies that came include Idemia, and that company I've already mentioned, Zetis, and seven other companies. Whilst that process was aborted, they now are in a desperate hurry to find a restricted tendering source sourcing arrangement to implement the software. We are verifying a few more things, but currently, what people that are, went through the process have told us, and remember, people, most of the people, they can't talk just as you know as journalists is that they intend to sole source that contract to create the software. And because you cannot build a custom software, you have to go back to Thales for the software, which will be in breach of the policy they have set to unbundle the two. But more importantly than that, you cannot get a source code for Thales' software, because this is globally. They're not going to give you the source code for that. Now, worse than all of this is that the software tender is likely to delay. Procurement of software might delay a little bit more. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because, remember, the software must be installed on the devices. And until the software is ready, you cannot install them on the so devices. So you say the EC timelines are given is unrealistic? Not only is it unrealistic, it sounds ridiculous. Well, but some say they will go to 2012, where we start to bought all these uh, biometric devices and still run an election. No. 2011, we concluded a tender in, um, for the, the equipment. And then in 24th March 2012, they're about we went and started the registration. That's like what, six months? Yeah. Integrated solution. No, I want the source code. No, I want a platform agnostic solution. No, I want a solution that can enable me to make additions to the, uh, to the, 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 the core software, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most, you know what that means? Enhanced customization. What do you require? Because if but, I have but, my But package, doesn't that make the system better? Good, if they do it. But if you do it that way, that's what I meant by best practice in my, my, mm. uh, my, my talk. If you do it that way, then you need extreme customization. You know why? If I'm Thales and I have equipment that I'm going to sell to 100 countries, I'm not going to give the source code, the source code for that. 
I'm going to customize some solution that you can have the source code to. Oh, maybe, that takes long. maybe EC is confident. So at this time, um, we know the EC's position. Mm -hmm. We know the NDC's position. We know your position and the M MPP's position. Mm. You say you've raised all these issues. You say you're considering other other avenues to Actually, push this through. I'm not sure whether people are very clear about how the positions differ. The NDC doesn't have a lot of problems with equipment. If they want a new equipment, that's yeah, theirs is the voter register. register. I mean, but but then the, it's the it's, MPP wants the register, and they don't care if you use the existing equipment to do yeah, it. Yeah, this is the just fighting. Once you have it, you know, no, register. if you use the existing equipment to do it, they don't care. Yeah. So, Imani is the only one saying that you actually don't need either. You don't need Both. a full new register and a full new equipment. Hmm. So there's slight differences that sometimes. Yeah. But in the end, what's your proposal, very brief in 30 seconds, hmm. to resolve this? You say EC shouldn't do it at all. They say they will. Well, I think that the EC should allow the uh, independent biometric uh, audits that we have proposed to go on. But do we have the time? We don't, do we? Well, it can be done in two weeks. Once we have the very detailed report of where, what the life cycle issues are, then let's objectively determine if you do need to complete it overhaul. Okay, so that's the proposal. Bring in, let's do the audit, and, and then that Gamme, should objectively Gamme, make Austin, it. The Austin Gamme, um, organization, uh, Gamma and Co. ADR, has proposed mm. that they will be ready to facilitate as professional mediators to come to that conclusion. Okay. The EC, if they were really interested in this and were really willing to be candid and truthful and fair, they would take this up. Bryce Simmons, I'm grateful that you joined us. Um, so there's a lot still at play here. We'll get the clarity as we proceed. This is timeline is April. Let's see how that pans out. Enjoy the rest of your evening.